Hello and welcome to STEAM Explore and Design Thinking. My name is Serena Lau and I will be your host for this learning experience. I'm a bird scientist at the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, or SFBBO for short. We're dedicated to conserving birds and their habitats, or the places where they live, through science and outreach. Today, we are learning about the amazing phenomenon of bird migration. Migration is a regular seasonal movement between breeding grounds and wintering grounds. This means that migratory birds are making the same journey every year to two different places. Many birds head south during the fall to get to their wintering grounds, and then they come back up north in the spring to get to their breeding grounds. This map shows where barn swallows are at different times of the year. They are a long distance migrant. They breed in North America in the summer, and then they move south to South America for the winter. There are about 10,000 different bird species in the world, and about 20% of them migrate. In North America, about 350 species are long distance migrants, traveling hundreds or even thousands of miles between North America and Central or South America every year. So why do birds migrate? Well, birds migrate to get to places where there are more resources at different times of the year. Birds tend to migrate northward in the spring to take advantage of abundant summer food resources, such as insects and plants that flourish in longer daylight hours. In these summer breeding grounds, there's also lots of nesting locations to choose from and plenty of food to feed their chicks. In the fall, as temperatures decrease and winter approaches, the number of insects and other food resources decreases so birds move south again to where they can find more food. For most migratory birds, the instinct to migrate is built into their DNA. They're born with this ability to make the journey. But some birds, like ducks and geese, have to actually learn how and where to migrate from their parents or other birds. So what triggers bird migration? Birds respond to changes in day length, temperature, and food supply. In fall, shorter days, lower temperatures, and decreased food supplies can trigger birds to migrate south for the winter. In spring, as temperatures warm up and the days get longer, that can signal for birds to migrate back north to their breeding grounds. Birds also respond to weather conditions when they're deciding when to migrate. They usually wait for good weather and favorable winds so they have an easier time flying. They'll usually try to avoid things like rain and winds that will blow them off course. Now we're going to watch a short video clip on bird migration. At the end of the clip, your teacher will take a pulse check. Ready? Let's take a look. Have you ever noticed how when the winter snows blow in, the seemingly never ending chorus of bird song quiets and all that's left are a few brave chickadees and cardinals. Where do the other birds go? Why do they leave? How do they know where they're going? My name is Katherine Grabenstein, and I'm a senior studying biology at Cornell University. Outside of class, I'm part of a research group at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology where I study bird behavior. Ornithology might sound like a scary word, but it just means the study of birds. I think birds are pretty amazing which is why I want to talk to you about an incredible natural phenomenon that happens every single year all across North America, fall bird migration. Migration is the seasonal movement from one place to another. That means that birds in North America leave their home the same time every year to head to the same place they did the year before and then come back to North America several months later. They pay attention to a lot of the same signals that you and I do such as changing temperatures, shortening days, and there's not as much food around as there used to be. So in preparation for their journey, birds spend weeks gorging themselves on food to fatten themselves up, sometimes doubling their weight. So the next time someone tells you to eat like a bird, tell them what it really means. In your STEAM kit, you will find a Love to Code booklet, copper tape, a red cable, a chippy clip, conductive fabric patches, which look like small ovals, and LED stickers, which look like white triangles. You will also need to have some of your own supplies, including a fully charged device with an audio jack, such as a laptop, tablet, or phone, a 
a pencil and eraser, a pair of scissors, a glue stick, scotch tape or masking tape, and color pencils, crayons, or markers. If you're curious to learn more about your STEAM kit, you're not alone. We'd like you to meet Fern the Frog, who's just like you. Let's watch Fern's story. Hi, I'm Gee Chi. I'm really excited to share my new circuit storybook called Love to Code Volume 1. It's a book where we learn about circuits and programming with our new friends like Fern the Frog and Sammy the Seal. Meet Fern, she's an awesome frog. She loves to make things and write and dance and play. Basically, she likes to create. One day, Fern sees her friends make these really awesome projects that light up and glow and do all sorts of things. And she wants to make things like that too. So she grabs all her stuff and then she runs happily along. But then she realizes this stuff is really hard and she gets really frustrated. And she even thinks, hey, maybe this isn't for me. Then her friend Sammy comes up and says, you know, Fern, some of this stuff is really hard, but you don't have to do it by yourself. And it can be really fun too. Let's try it together. Will you come with me? And so Fern brightens at the thought and says, huh, what do I have to lose? So Fern jumps in. As you go through the book with Fern and friends, you'll learn all sorts of cool stuff, like how to build a paper switch and blink an LED. you also learn cool programming concepts like if statements and loops and even multi-threading. At the end of the book is a chapter on debugging. This is when you find problems in your code and fix them. It's frustrating sometimes, but don't worry, our good friend Debug will be here to help you. As Fern goes through her adventures, we're all going to learn how to make all sorts of cool stuff with circuits and code. Come learn and play with us! Have fun! Your first hands-on design challenge is to light up an LED and create a bird-related scene around the light. To walk you through this, let's watch this walkthrough video. Hi, welcome to the walkthrough for chapter one, light up an LED. Open your chibi book to page 1-2. The exercise is called, turn on a light. Get your materials together. You'll need an LED sticker, copper tape, and a USB power source, which is built into your chibi book. And of course, your chibi chip. First, take some copper tape and peel off the white paper backing. Stick it over one of the gray lines. Try to lay it flat, smooth out any wrinkles using your fingers. Snip off the end with scissors or tear with your fingers. Repeat for the other gray line. Now take a cluster of white LED stickers and peel one of the stickers off. Make sure the point of the LED sticker is lined up with the red triangle on the page. Press down on the LED sticker's gold metal edges to make a strong bond with the copper tape. Now turn on the power for the chibi book by flipping the switch. A green power light will turn on. Clip the chibi chip onto the page as shown. You'll see the white LED glow. Turn the page and you'll see Fern and Sammy holding a canvas. Let's draw a scene around the light. First, use a pencil to mark the position of the light on the page.
Then remove the page from the binder and put it on the table so you have a flat surface to draw on. We're going to draw a seal, lighting up a ball with its nose. First we sketch the scene using a pencil. Then we ink over the scene using a pen. Once we're finished inking, we can erase the pencil sketch, leaving just the pen outlines. Now we're going to color in the seal. We're using watercolor, but you can use your favorite crayons, pens, paints, or pencils to do the job. With a red dot to finish off the nose, let's take the finished picture and drop it back into the binder. Voila! Our magical seal is lighting up the ball with its nose. That's it for the walkthrough of Chapter 1, Light Up an LED. Congratulations on completing your first design challenge! In the previous section, we learned about why birds migrate and what triggers migration. Now let's learn about migratory flyways. A flyway is a flight path that many migratory birds use to travel between their wintering grounds and their breeding grounds. In North America, we have four major flyways. The Pacific Flyway along the west coast, the Central Flyway along the middle of the country, the Mississippi Flyway along the Mississippi River, and the Atlantic Flyway along the east coast. Billions of birds use these flyways each year to move north and south. There are six other major migratory flyways in the world, covering Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. But not all migratory birds use these flyways. Some are short distance migrants, some migrate east and west, and still others migrate up and down mountains. Some birds are extreme migrants. The Arctic Tern holds the record for the longest migration route. They usually fly about 20,000 miles each year between the North Pole, the Arctic, and the South Pole, the Antarctic. One Arctic Tern was even recorded to have flown nearly 50,000 miles in a single year. That's about twice the circumference of the Earth. As for the highest flying migratory bird, the common crane and bar-headed goose have been seen flying over the Himalayas, where Mount Everest, Earth's tallest peak, is located. That's about 30,000 feet high. These migratory birds are truly impressive. To learn more about how migratory birds cover such long distances and how they find their way, let's watch this video clip. At the end of the clip, your teacher will take another pulse check. Birds spend so much energy flying that they can actually lose 1% of their body weight per hour. That's like the average size man losing 2 pounds per hour just walking around. Because flying for long distances requires so much energy, it's crucial for birds' survival that they eat enough before they leave. They also can't leave too late, or there might not be enough food along the way for them to make it to their destination. It's important for birds to have enough food, but it's not just important that they have enough energy for them to get there. It's also important that they spend the right amount of energy while flying. Something that surprised scientists when they first learned that birds migrated was how far they went. How could something that weighs less than an apple travel thousands of miles without dropping dead out of the sky? The answer is simple addition and subtraction. The average bird flies at about 30 miles per hour. If you throw in a favorable tailwind of about 10 miles per hour, suddenly that bird is soaring at 40 miles per hour. If that same bird encounters a headwind of 10 miles per hour, suddenly it's only going 20 miles per hour. Most songbirds wait for the passage of a strong cold front because cold fronts create strong north-south winds, which is the direction that the birds want to travel. Most birds will wait for these favorable wind conditions and then take off together as a large group. 
There are two types of birds, those that migrate during the day and those that fly at night. Most large birds, such as raptors, tend to fly during the day because they aren't threatened by predators. They are the predators. They find thermals, which are rising pockets of warm air, and glide on these thermals to get to their destination. The birds that migrate at night tend to be much smaller, like warblers or sparrows. Migrating is exhausting, and small birds would be easy pickings for predators. They fly at night under the cover of darkness to decrease their chances of being eaten along the way. Once birds know when to migrate, where do they actually go? Most birds tend to head for warmer weather in either Central or South America. In North America, they follow four major flyways. These flyways travel along major landmarks like coastlines, mountain ranges, or river valleys. Birds on the Atlantic flyway follow the east coast down to the tip of Florida. From there, they head to South America. Birds on the Mississippi Flyway follow the Mississippi River down to the Delta. From there, they take a shortcut across the Gulf of Mexico to head to South America. The Central Flyway runs down the middle of the United States. Birds on this flyway fly overland through Mexico and Central America. For the Pacific Flyway, birds use the Pacific Coast and Rocky Mountains to guide them southward to their destination. Using major landmarks like mountains and river valleys may seem easy, but how do birds find them when they're flying in the dark? The birds use the stars as a compass to point them south. Now it's time for your second hands-on design challenge. You'll learn to code a blink and make your paper circuit come alive. You can then create another bird-related scene around that blinking light. To guide you through this, let's watch another walkthrough video. Hi, welcome to the walkthrough for Chapter 2, Code a Blink. In this exercise, we learn how to make an LED blink using code. Open your chibi book to page 2-2. The exercise is called Let's Get Coding. In addition to copper tape, LED stickers, and the chibi book and chip, you will also need a programming device that's connected to the internet. Any computer, laptop, tablet, or phone that can open a web browser should work. First, point your web browser to ltc.chibitronics.com. Then, click on the Examples button to bring up a menu of examples. Click on Love to Code Volume 1, and then click on Basic Blink to load the Basic Blink example code. The text you see here are the instructions that tell the Chibi chip how to blink an LED. Next, make sure your volume is turned all the way up on your computer. This is important to allow the Chibi chip to hear your instructions. Plug the audio jack into the headphone output of your programming device. Also, if the power isn't on yet to your Chibi chip, go ahead and turn it on now. Next, press and hold the small flat button near the USB connector until the LED labeled PROG turns red. Let go once the light turns red. Now click the Upload button on the browser. Within a few seconds, you'll see an orange soundbar animate across the bottom of the web page. The soundbar is a picture of the sound waveforms being uploaded to the Chibi chip. If everything went well, the red PROG light will turn green, and the LED over pin 0 will start blinking. Why did we make the LED blink? Let's build a scene using the blinking light. Let's start by turning to the template on page 2-12. In this example, we need to turn a corner using the copper tape. Here's a trick for making neat turns using the copper tape. Lay down the copper tape until the corner of the turn. Then, fold the copper tape away from the direction you ultimately want to turn towards so that the sticky side is up. Crease the tape. Now fold the copper tape toward the final direction of the turn. The tape will line up nicely over the gray line. See? Press it down and tear or cut the tape and repeat for the other gray line. Now take a white LED sticker and apply it to the red triangle on the page. Pay attention to the direction of the point on the page. Press down on the metal edges of the LED sticker to make a firm connection to the copper tape. 
Also, if the power isn't on yet to your chibi chip, go ahead and turn it on now. Attach your chibi chip to the edge of the page. You should now see the LED blinking. What's playing on the stage? Let's take the page out and draw a scene. For this scene, we'll draw on the back side of the page so that the light projects shadows of our drawing onto the other side. Pretty cool, huh? Flip the page and you'll see an empty stage. For best results, use a pen that doesn't bleed through the paper so the surprise isn't ruined by ink bleeding through the page. First, we sketch out the scene using pencil. Then we use an ink pen to fill in the scene. We make sure to fill it thoroughly so it blocks the light going through the page. Now let's put the page back into the binder and see what it looks like. Ta-da! The light reveals Juliet leaning over to see what's below. If the scene you drew is large like ours, you can use a neat trick to add more light. If you stick a second sticker down in parallel with the first, both will light at the same time. Let's see the scene again. The extra light reveals Romeo, on one knee no less. How romantic! Let's play with the code some more. Using small changes to example program, we can change how fast the light flashes. Turn to page 2-10 to see how. Here we can edit the numbers inside the pause statement from 1000 milliseconds to 500 milliseconds to make the light blink twice as fast. Press the button on the board again until the probe light turns red and then hit upload. The light's blinking much faster now. Page 2-11 shows how you can make more complex patterns of blinking. You can copy and paste existing statements and just tweak the numbers inside until you match the sample code. Press the PROG button and upload your changes and see how the pattern changes. Try playing around with other numbers and combinations of statements and see what other things you can do to enhance the scene. That's it for the walkthrough of Chapter 2, Coda Blink. You've learned a lot about bird migration and the amazing journey that many birds make every year. In this section, we'll learn about why we should care about birds. Why are they important? For one thing, birds are part of the ecosystem. An ecosystem is a place and all the living things there, like plants and animals, and the things that they interact with, like the air, the water, and the soil. One way that birds are part of the ecosystem is that they are part of the food web. A food web is the flow of energy through the ecosystem. Here is a simple example with a food chain. One of the main parts of many ecosystems is plants. Plants are really important. They provide animals with food and shelter, and they provide us all with the oxygen we need to breathe. Many animals, like insects, eat plants. And it turns out, many birds eat insects. And this is a really important role that birds play, because by eating insects, they help to make sure that there aren't too many insects in the ecosystem eating the plants that we all need. So that is one really important role that birds play in the ecosystem. Birds can also provide energy for other animals. For example, animals like snakes and foxes sometimes eat birds, so that's another important role that birds play. And finally, some birds can be at the top of the food chain, like eagles, falcons, and hawks. In this example, you can see that birds can play multiple roles in the ecosystem. 
and each of these is important for helping to keep the ecosystem in balance. Because birds are part of the ecosystem, they can tell us about the health of the environment. Birds are relatively easy to see and hear compared to other animals, so they're a great indicator of environmental health. For example, if we see a place with lots of birds and they're having lots of chicks, that could be telling us that this is a really healthy environment for them. They have enough food and shelter to survive and raise their chicks. But if we see a change where maybe not as many birds are coming back or they're not having as many chicks, that could be a signal that something has changed in the environment. For example, maybe there's pollution in the water or some of their habitat has been destroyed. And this is really important for us humans to know too, because we too need a clean environment, a healthy environment to live. Another role that birds can play in the ecosystem is that they can help spread plants. For example, hummingbirds are pollinators. And when they drink nectar from a flower, they can spread that flower's pollen to another flower. And that in turn helps create more plants. Many birds also eat fruits, which contain seeds. So birds can help spread that seed to other areas, which turn into new trees and plants, which in turn creates even more food and shelter for more animals. Because birds are everywhere, they have become an important part of human society. For example, birds are often symbols in many cultures. Doves may represent peace, owls can represent wisdom, and the bald eagle is the national symbol of the United States, representing freedom and courage. Birds also inspire art. Bird songs inspire music, and bird movements inspire dance. For example, there's a famous ballet called Swan Lake. You might also notice birds in drawings or paintings, and several TV shows, video games, and movies take inspiration from birds as well, such as Angry Birds, for example. And of course, Twitter is also inspired by birds. This goes to show that no matter where you are, birds are bound to show up. You just have to take a moment to notice them. Plus, appreciating birds and being in nature is good for our mental and physical well-being. Now it's time for another pulse check. Your third hands-on design challenge is to add a switch to turn on the light. Let's watch this walkthrough video to help you. Hi, welcome to the walkthrough for chapter three, Add a Switch, part one. In this exercise, we learn how to craft and code for a switch. Let's start by loading the switch example code onto your Chibi chip. Go to ltc.chibitronics.com Click Examples and then Love to Code Volume 1, you should see a menu item for Basic Switch. Click on Basic Switch. Here you see the basic code for interacting with a switch. Inside the loop, it reads the value of pin 5 into a variable called pressed. This if statement checks to see if the value of the variable pressed is equal to 1. This check is called the condition of the if statement. If the switch is pressed, the condition is true and the top block of the code runs, which turns pin 0 on. Else, the condition is false and the bottom block of the code runs, which turns pin 0 off. Remember, the code inside the loop gets run over and over, so after the chibi chip checks the value of pressed, it goes back to the top of the loop and reads the value of pin 5 again. To upload the example, press and hold the probe button until the probe light turns red, and click Upload. Remember that the volume needs to be turned all the way up! When programming is complete, the probe light will turn green. If you aren't touching any of the pins on the chibi chip, this will be the only indication that the programming is finished. Now open your chibi book to page 3-4 to the exercise called Push Button Switch Template. First, lay down copper tape over the gray lines. If you need help turning corners, check out the walkthrough for Chapter 2, where we make corner turns neat and tidy. Be sure to smooth out any wrinkles in the copper tape, especially at the ends.
Add a small piece of copper tape to the gray line on the bottom. This piece of tape forms the contact of the switch. The contact will touch across the two copper tape ends directly above the dotted fold. Now take a pair of scissors and cut along the red lines and fold on the dotted line. You've made a switch! Add a white LED, making sure you align the point of the LED to the point of the red outline on the page. Attach your chibi chip to the edge of the page and press down on the switch. You should see the LED light up when the switch is pressed. We're not done yet. What happens when you press on Edith's tail? Flip the page and circle the position of the light and remove the page from the book so that we can draw a scene. Starting from the light's center, we pencil sketch a quick scene. Hey, Edith is pressing on a cat's tail. Let's ink in the scene and add a bit of color to finish it off. Let's put the page back into the chibi book and check out the result. Edith's tail makes the cat spell light up. We can combine what we learned in chapter two with our switch example to make the cat spell blink instead of just lighting up. Turn to page 3-14 to see our modifications. Remember, the if statement has two code paths. The top code block is run only when the condition inside the if is true, which happens when the switch is pressed. The bottom code block only runs when the switch is not pressed. Once you're done making the changes, press and hold the probe button until the light turns red and upload your new code. Attach your chibi chip to the page and press Edith's tail again. Now the cat's bell blinks when the switch is pressed. That's it for part one of the walkthrough of chapter three, add a switch. We've learned a lot of interesting facts about birds and their seasonal migrations. Birds actually evolved from dinosaurs and have been around for millions of years. But unfortunately, humans are now posing a major threat to bird populations. To learn more about the threats that migratory birds face, let's watch this video clip. With such a long distance to cover, there are plenty of things that can go wrong along the way. Being eaten is always a risk. After flying all day, small birds would be too exhausted to escape a predator if they were attacked. Even though birds wait for favorable winds, inclement weather is often unexpected. Imagine being a tiny warbler flying along when suddenly you encounter a raging hurricane. Strong storms can blow birds off course or even out to sea. And if birds manage to find shelter during the storms, they're often delayed for days, unable to fly in the rough winds. Humans also have a huge impact on migrating birds. In cities, it is estimated that nearly one billion birds each year die from flying into tall reflective buildings. Light pollution also poses a major threat to migrating birds. Lights confuse birds and they are unable to use their star compass as they move at night. But perhaps the greatest impact humans have on bird migration is through habitat destruction. Many birds take weeks or months to reach their destination. They stop at familiar locations to rest and refuel before continuing on. But what happens when a black-throated blue warbler is on its way to Cuba and in Virginia the forest that it usually stops at has been replaced with a brand new strip mall? This is exactly what faces migrating birds all over North America. Stopover sites they have used for thousands of years are being changed into shopping malls and housing developments. Because migratory birds rely on multiple habitats, it's important for both habitats to be protected. If they don't, those birds are in big trouble. Most migrating birds spend half of the year in North America and half of the year in South America. And it's important for both countries to work together in unison to protect the bird and its native habitat. If only one country works towards protecting the habitat, that effort is likely to fail because both habitats need to be conserved.
But humans also have the power to help migrating birds by studying the routes they take and then helping to protect these areas. And a great part about studying bird migration is that anyone can be a bird migration scientist. All you have to do is go outside, see birds, and then note where you see them. In fact, scientists who study bird migration rely on people just like you to help them collect their data. Scientists then use this data to generate maps of bird movement across the United States. Birds are pretty incredible creatures capable of migrating thousands of miles. They are able to sense when the conditions are just right for them to start their long journey, navigate over thousands of miles to reach the exact location they intend to, and ultimately find their way back home again. So the next time you're outside, pay attention to the birds. Maybe they're fattening up for the long journey ahead of them, or they might have just flown several hundred miles to be in front of you at that very moment. Regardless, it's hard enough as it is migrating as a bird. Let's do everything that we can to help protect the routes that they take and also the places they call their home. So, are you ready to help protect our migratory birds? To help us tackle the challenge of conserving birds, we'll have Miss Amy Drake introduce us to design thinking and walk us through the steps. The design thinking process is a carefully crafted process that helps you look at problems or opportunities and find creative solutions. The design thinking process is made up of six clear steps. Now don't worry, we're gonna walk you through each and every step so that you can engage effectively in that process. Design engineers always come to the process with a growth mindset. As you know, a growth mindset means you're ready to learn, you're willing to take chances, and you certainly will learn from your mistakes. Design engineers also believe in three key things. The first is radical collaboration. Radical collaboration means that you are willing to listen, and not just listen, but listen with the intent to understand what someone's saying. It also means that you're willing to build on the thinking of others. You'll ask follow-up questions. You will maybe add on to what someone said. And perhaps you can connect the group members' ideas together to help lead to new ideas. Finally, it means that you're willing to accept feedback. Radical collaboration that has feedback in it leads to innovation and creative solutions. Sometimes people with a fixed mindset, they hear feedback as criticism, and we don't want that in the design thinking process. We want it all to lead to creativity and innovation. Now, the second key element that design engineers believe in is called experimentation. That simply means you're willing to try many ideas. You're willing to try whatever works best. You don't need to use only your own ideas, but whatever works best. And the last key element that design engineers believe in is the design thinking process. That means that you're willing to engage in each and every step of the process. You won't skip over any or disregard some. Instead, you'll engage in all six steps so that you can really come up with a creative solution to your problem or opportunity. Design engineers, we have to come to an agreement. Are you willing to bring your growth mindset to the process? Will you engage in radical collaboration and experimentation? And will you commit to completing all six steps of the design thinking process? If you agree, give us a thumbs up. All right, let's move on. Design engineers start with two key questions. First, what is the problem that we're facing or the opportunity that we have? And second, who are we helping or serving with our design? Now let's take a look at these two questions that Ms. Drake asked. The problem we face is that many migratory bird populations are declining due to human-caused threats. The goal, of course, is to help migratory birds. For our design challenge, we're going to focus on two major threats, habitat destruction and bird collisions with human-caused structures. Since 1970, we have lost nearly 3 billion birds in the U.S. and Canada. This means that there are nearly 30% fewer birds now than there were 50 years ago. Habitat destruction is one of the main causes of decline for birds and other wildlife. Humans have torn down forests, marshes, grasslands, and other ecosystems 
and replace them with cities, farms, roads, and industries. When birds lose habitat, they lose their homes. They can't find shelter, get the food they need to refuel, or raise their chicks. And remember that migratory birds have several different homes throughout the year. Their summer home, their winter home, and the stopover areas in between. So losing any one of these habitats is a major threat to migratory birds. As birds lose more of their natural habitat, they can become more exposed to other threats, such as collisions with human-built structures. Birds can collide with planes, cars, power lines, and more. Today we'll focus on two structures, wind turbines and buildings. Wind turbines are tall structures with rotating blades that spin when there's wind to create electricity. Wind turbines are estimated to kill about 300,000 birds each year in the U.S. alone. Meanwhile, buildings kill up to a billion birds each year in the U.S. Why is this happening? Wind turbines present a challenging problem. On the one hand, having renewable energy is great so that we don't have to burn as many fossil fuels, which pollutes the environment and is a limited resource. On the other hand, how environmentally friendly are wind turbines if they're killing wildlife, such as birds and bats? Birds of prey, like eagles, are one of the main concerns because their populations are smaller and they take a longer time to mature and produce chicks. So losing just a few of these raptors makes a bigger dent in the population. The main problem with wind turbines is that these tall structures have those spinning blades and they actually spin really fast, often over 100 miles per hour. So when birds get close enough to those blades, they can't avoid colliding with them. Another problem with wind turbines is that we often want to put them in places where there's a lot of wind so that we can maximize the amount of energy produced from them. However, these are often the places where many birds are migrating through, because remember, wind is really important for bird migration. So one solution to reduce this threat to birds is to put wind turbines in places where there aren't as many birds migrating through. People have also experimented with different wind turbine designs that don't use blades to help reduce their impact on wildlife. We'll come back and learn about other solutions later. Now, buildings are a big problem for birds. Remember, up to a billion birds die each year in the US from buildings. And that's because there are so many buildings here, and the problem is usually the windows. The glass on the windows can act as a mirror reflecting the sky or trees, and so birds will fly into it thinking it's more habitat. Or the glass can be completely transparent, and birds will fly into it trying to get to the other side because they can't see the glass. Even humans sometimes walk into glass. Now imagine running full speed into it. And unlike humans, migratory birds are often just passing through cities, so they haven't had time to learn what glass is, and they often can't see that it's basically a wall. Another related problem is light pollution. Many small birds migrate at night, using the stars to help them navigate. Bright city lights can confuse and attract birds, so these birds can be drawn to big cities where they're exposed to other dangers, like glass, cars, and urban predators. Some ways people are helping to reduce the problem are turning off lights at night during migration and adding patterns like dots or stripes placed close together on windows so that birds can see that there's a barrier. Let's take a look at some more solutions that have been shown to reduce bird collisions with human-built structures. By law, many tall structures have to have lights on them so that airplanes can detect them at night. But as we've learned, these lights can attract and confuse birds. Studies have shown that by switching from lights that are always on to lights that are flashing can reduce bird strikes by up to 50 to 70%. This simple solution can be applied to nearly any tall lighted structure to help save birds. Another study at a wind farm in Norway showed that for wind turbines, painting one of the three turbine blades black resulted in 70% fewer bird strikes. 
it seems that painting one of the blades black makes it easier for birds to see those spinning blades. Although this method needs to be tested in more places, it's a simple and promising solution to help reduce the number of bird strikes with wind turbines. Now that you have learned so much about migratory birds and the threats they face, your next challenge is to pick one of the problems, habitat destruction or bird strikes, and design a solution to that problem. And don't worry, Ms. Drake will walk you through each step of the design thinking process to help you creatively problem solve as a group. Good luck with your design challenge. Design engineers, you are ready to engage in the design thinking process. The first stage of this process is called empathy. Empathy means that we can think and see and feel things from another person's point of view. Now, in the real world, you would spend some time interviewing or observing your user group to really understand their needs and their wants and their limitations. Now, today, you will not be interviewing or observing your user group. Instead, you'll have to rely on the collective knowledge of your team to really empathize with your user group. We want to help you a little bit in that. And as you engage in a team discussion, we've provided questions for you. So talk about these questions and any other questions that you can think of that will help you really understand the needs, the wants, and the limitations of your user group so that your design will ultimately meet their needs. You've had a great chance to talk with your team members and really empathize with your user group. So it's time for us to move to the next phase of the design thinking process. That is the define phase. When we define, we're talking about really zeroing in and clearly stating the user group, the user group's needs, and the desired outcome we want them to have after engaging with our design. Now this step is critical because it will set you on a clear path and guide your thinking for the rest of the design process. So to help you with this, we have provided some sentence stems for your group so you can clearly think through these critical elements. Design engineers, it is time for us to move on to the next phase of the design thinking process. We call that ideate. Ideate means that we are going to generate many ideas. Now, don't worry about having bad ideas because what seems like a bad idea today may turn out to be a great idea later on. And it also may lead us to different creative thoughts. This is a pretty dynamic part of the design thinking process. So I wanna go over a few ground rules. First, don't judge ideas. Remember, we are going for volume. That means many ideas. Second, be visual when you can. Maybe get some colored post-it notes. Think about putting those on a poster board. Third, I want you to build on the thinking of others. Ask those follow-up questions, connect ideas, add on whenever you can. Next, I want you to try to have one conversation. That means that we won't be talking over each other. We can get pretty lively and pretty loud, but it'll still be important to take turns when we're speaking. And finally, I want you to try to stay on topic. Now, when we talk about this ideate process, I wanna give you a little bit of a jump start. perhaps maybe a few samples. Maybe your team wants to create something that looks like a mind map, maybe a big bubble with lines coming off of it where everyone's writing their ideas on a different line. Maybe it is visual, as I stated before, using different colored post-it notes on a poster board, or perhaps maybe you wanna draw a picture or do something like that. And then that picture leads to other creative ideas. What I really want you to know is that there's no right way to ideate. As long as you're generating many ideas, you're doing it. All right, design engineers, it's time to get going. Go create those ideas. It's time to move on to the prototype phase of the design thinking process. Now, to prototype means to make a model, a simulation, or a mock-up of your design. 
Now, it's easier to communicate your ideas when you can actually see them rather than just talk about them, right? Or even draw them. That's why we're going to build this model today and it will help you understand what's working and what's not working. Design engineers, I would like to thank you for your attention. I know it's hard to pause in the middle of the prototype phase. Now that I have your attention, I'd like to congratulate you because you are already engaging in the feedback phase of the design thinking process. You see, feedback is any time we understand what's working and what's not working in our design. So if something's working, we probably repeat it. And if something's not working, then we have to make a change. That's feedback too. What you're going to do as a team is kind of figure out some of the feedback that you've already built your understanding on, and then you're going to have a chance to share that with the class because you may learn something from another team in your classroom that will help you with your design. So each team should share one piece of feedback that they had so far in the building process so that the rest of the class can benefit from that learning. You've finished your prototypes, and now it's time to move on to the reflection phase of the design thinking process. We are going to break this phase into two different parts. The first part will allow each team to share their prototype. Let's focus on that. As the teams come forward, each team should specifically state their user group and what were their needs and wants. Then we want you to explain the design to us and how that design meets the needs of the user group. Then, of course, you get to test that prototype. Show us how it works. Maybe even explain how you use feedback and where you overcame some of your problems. And finally, we want to just hear a little bit about what worked best for you when you were working as a team on that design and maybe some struggles that you're still having with your design and how you might take next steps if you were to do that in the design process. Now we want to move to the last part of our reflection phase of the design thinking process. And that is, we want you to think bigger. We want you to think about the entire design thinking process. We want you to consider what were the things that worked really well for you? What were the areas in which you struggled? This is really important because it will help make the learning that you had today real. It will help you apply the design thinking process in the future as you see other problems and opportunities. So we've provided some discussion questions for your class and we'll post them up here so you can refer to those as you discuss and reflect on today's lesson. Congratulations on completing your design challenge. I hope you enjoyed the bird's eye view learning experience. I hope you'll appreciate nature and birds all around you and that you'll use your problem solving skills to tackle other problems in the world. Great job.